Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to give you a warm welcome to this virtual event titled Catalyzing a Decade of Climate Action in Global Travel and Tourism to welcome us all uh, today. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ivan McKee, Scottish Government uh, Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise. Allow me to extend a warm welcome to everyone here for the conference. It's been a difficult time for the tourism sector globally due to the pandemic. And here in Scotland, we've maintained a strong focus on supporting the sector in the short term, but also crucially maintaining our medium and long term ambitions too. We believe that tourism is a force for good and it can indeed must play its role in the green recovery. And it's important that we discuss innovative solutions to accelerate our progress to achieving net zero, which is very much the purpose, of course, of today's event. Scotland has committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2045, with an ambitious interim target of a 75% reduction by 2030. We have already halved our greenhouse gas emissions since 1990. We have shifted almost 100% of our electricity use so that it now comes from renewable sources. Our funding for energy efficiency has benefited over 150,000 households since 2013. And in less than 10 years, we have funded the restoration of around 30,000 hectares of peatland. And in the last three years alone, have created over 32,000 hectares of new woodland. We're also one of the very few countries to have set legally binding annual emissions targets for every year from now until we deliver net zero. These statutory targets form the heart of our indicative national determined contribution published ahead of COP26. While progress has been made across all parts of Scotland's economy and society, the scale and urgency of the task ahead is significant and we still must do more. Complacency is not an option. Our updated climate change plan provides a clear and credible pathway to meeting our emissions targets out to 2032. Partnership will be important at home, across the EU and globally in achieving and accelerating our climate ambitions. I am therefore delighted to open this international facing event across public and private sectors alike. Many barriers and challenges to consider as we work towards net zero, but there are fantastic opportunities for us all too as destinations, as businesses and as communities. In the context of this morning's launch of the Glasgow Declaration, this event is very much aimed at exploring, in partnership, the next steps for action. We see many examples of good practice from around the globe, and Scotland has always been an outward-looking nation, collaborative, willing to share and be inspired in return. It's my pleasure, therefore, to welcome you, albeit virtually, to Scotland and to open this event, demonstrating tourism's commitment and action to achieving net zero. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Scotland's net zero targets are indeed ambitious, so it's great to hear about the encouraging progress uh, so far. Uh, we know that all sectors need to play their part, so uh, what about tourism? Let's hear from Visit Scotland's uh, Chairman, uh, Lord Thurso. Lord Thurso, good afternoon. The floor is yours. Good afternoon to you and good afternoon to everybody else. Um, and uh, let me add my very warm welcome to Glasgow as well. Around this time in about 2019, I delivered a lecture in Brussels in which I set out uh, the ambitions that Visit Scotland had for a sustainable future. And so I'm really delighted to be here today, two years later, to introduce an event that is focused on what we and our partners and colleagues around the globe are delivering on that ever more urgent journey to net zero emissions. Today, you'll hear, for example, about Scotland's 4 million destination net zero programme, which will provide support to tourism businesses and destinations as they transition to a greener, more sustainable future. I'm also very proud that as an organisation, Visit Scotland has reduced its own carbon footprint by over 70% over the past nine years. We truly are working to try to practice what we preach. 
We've also had a great panel discussion later on with five destinations that are already delivering action towards net zero. And I'm particularly pleased that Visit Scotland is working in partnership with sustainably focused tourism bodies such as Tourism Declares, the Future of Tourism Coalition, the Nest Tour, which represents 39 regional tourism organisations across Europe. We all know why we're here. COP26 presents a unique opportunity to demonstrate the decisive action that is being taken in Scotland and around the globe to secure our future prosperity in the face of the growing climate crisis. The time for talk has drawn to an end. The time for action is, at a big, is now. Uh, or as somebody put it, blah, blah, blah is over. Time now for cha, cha, cha. It is action and deeds that are required, and we need to focus on sharing. Let's also be clear, achieving net zero emissions in tourism won't be easy. So it's equally important that today we look at the enablers and the barriers so that we know what the challenge is and we can use the opportunities. That means we're all gonna have to think differently about what kind of tourism we want, about how we promote it, how we deliver our product offering, how we target and engage our visitors and collaborate with the industry, and how we use tourism to support communities in a respectful way. In Scotland, almost three quarters of our residents agree that climate change is an immediate and urgent problem. And so there's a real opportunity for businesses to shout about their eco experiences and cater for the new market. This morning saw the launch of the Glasgow Declaration, asking stakeholders around the world to take action. And many of you here this afternoon, including our panelists, already are. Others want to start. For me, this event very much is very much about how we bring that declaration to life. Before I finish, I must also say a big thank you to our wonderful moderator, Virginia, from the UNW for joining us despite her extremely busy schedule and to all of our panelists for being so willing to share your good work with everyone here today and to our key partners in this event tourism declares the future of tourism collaborate uh, coalition and the network of european regions for competitive and sustainable tourism i believe we have much to do I believe there are grave challenges, but I believe also there is a tremendous opportunity for the force that is good, uh, that is tourism, which is a force for good. So thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, Lord Thurso. Really a pleasure to, to be here. And as you said, definitely an opportunity we must uh, grasp. So thank you so much for sharing the perspective of, of Visit uh, Scotland. I am really looking forward to, to hearing about the Net Zero program of activity. I know uh, it's part of Visit Scotland's uh, climate action plan. So that, that would be inspiring uh, to hear. But but first, and in light of the launch of the Glasgow uh, Declaration, we, we have with us uh, Jeremy Smith, co-founder of Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency. For those who may not be aware, Tourism Declares is a global community of 377 tourism organizations, companies and professionals, and all of them committed to delivering climate action uh, plans aligned with the need to cut emissions in half by 2030. So Jeremy is going to introduce us to the Glasgow Declaration, what it is, what it means, and how it can help guide us in the delivery of climate action, whatever our business, organization, or network looks like. So Jeremy, over to you. Um, Lord Thurso mentioned people looking to know where to start. Where does this start? So as we look at catalyzing throughout these various different sectors and how we expand this across the whole of our industry and the whole of the world. I just take a moment to step back to the actual start point this began at, at least in my mind. This beach is in northern Mozambique. I was there 10 years ago, staying at a remarkable lodge that is one of, was one of the world's leading environmental tourism, sustainable tourism destinations. It was an incredible place. But in April 2019, Cyclone Kenneth washed in off the Indian Ocean at 140 miles an hour. And when, within the space of five minutes, 10 minutes, 
the lodge, all the work it had done, and 14 villages were completely destroyed. The lodge never came back. The people who behind the lodge are still working with the villages, doing what they can to be there. And in that moment, I just saw the fragility of tourism that chooses so often to be in the sort of remote, beautiful places that you have seen from our holding slides on each of our names, but also the opportunity we have because of how we bring people from all around the world to connect to these beautiful places. Within a couple of weeks, the first Tourism Declares tweet went out, calling on the industry without knowing what it would mean that we needed to declare and to transform our model to something that would support communities and regenerate biodiversity. Over the course of the next few months, conversations began, particularly with myself and Alex Narricott, the founder of Much Better Adventures. And then we brought in other tourism companies. And by January 2020, we had 14 founder signatories that launched together Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency. Now, November 21, we have 392 members headquartered in over 60 countries covering all sectors. Most importantly, from the very beginning, what we set out to do was to say that everyone in tourism needed to publish a plan for what it is, that, what their climate action would look like, to publish a climate action plan. That couldn't just be, here's what we want to do. It had to be grounded in science. We have to respond to the severity of the emergency with the appropriate response. And finally, we have to work together. We have to collaborate. That's what everything that is here and this event and has been throughout these sessions at COP is about. We either all succeed or we all fail. So we have to work together, share best practice, share our challenges. The 392 members are mostly small, medium sized enterprises. They're businesses who really get it. Destinations like Visit Scotland. But of course, we have to expand this. Over the last six months, we've been working on the Glasgow Declaration with UNWTO, United Nations Environment Programme, Visit Scotland and the Travel Foundation to launch, as Virginia said, this declaration that was launched this morning. It wasn't just them that came on board. I'm not expecting you for one second to see who was there. I just want it to be acknowledged that all these people and all these organisations brought their own expertise, their own understanding. These are people who work in tourism as private sector. These are activists, these are environmentalists, these are scientists, these are community groups, indigenous tourism. Everyone fed in to make sure that somehow 800 words represented the totality of how our industry could come together. And that now, as of today, on the One Planet Network website, is what the Glasgow Declaration looks like. 800 words of commitment that summarised can be this. We are shared commitment to unite all stakeholders to transform tourism. We're not inventing science, we're supporting the global commitment to halve emissions by 2030 and reach net zero. We will consistently align our actions with the latest science and we will deliver climate action plans within 12 months of signing. In other words, as with tourism declares, publish a plan, base it on science and work together. And we've seen just in the last seven days, we put this, it was enabled to be signed seven days ago. And in just these first seven days, we've seen major companies. Accor is one of the largest hotel companies in the world. It has 250,000 employees. Iberostar, Intrepid, Skyscanner, businesses that are huge have come on board and said, yes, we will shift our business model. We commit, we are part of this. Major supporting organisations from around the tourism industry, the Association of British Travel Agents, the European Tourism Association, the South Pacific Tourism Organisation, Travelist, the WTTC. And most significantly, I think, we've seen more destinations join that first move that was made by Visit Scotland. We see Barbados, the Eastern Caribbean states, Kiribati, Micronesia, the Netherlands, Norway should also be written down there, Panama, all these states have come together to declare a climate emergency. And what you see when you look at Barbados, Eastern Caribbean, Kiribati, Micronesia in particular, is how fragile these places are. These are the places, the low-lying islands that are most vulnerable towards it. They are the ones stepping up and saying now, we need to make the change, we need to transform. And at the heart of the Glasgow Declaration is exactly that language. This isn't just about redesigning our businesses in order to be as profitable as possible. This is saying climate change's impacts are most severely felt by underrepresented and vulnerable communities such as women, indigenous communities, people living with disabilities and small island states. A just and inclusive transformation must prioritise their voices and needs as well as those of younger generations who would otherwise pay the full price 
of our own action. So how do we do that? We've got five pathways for plans. The first pathway is measure. Everyone needs to measure. We need to come together and align our measurements so that this industry can understand what it is doing, where it should invest its energies. We need to coordinate that because one thing we found is the very little understanding on how to do it or how to do it in a way that relates to how other people are trying to do it. This week, two steps forward are made with the launch of the net zero methodology for hotels, and an open source guide for tour operators to set a science based target. Come to Tourism Declares in the next few days. They'll be uploaded there. They're not just with us. They've been created by Greenview, created by Intrepid. They're there to help tour operators and accommodation move forward. Of course, we need to decarbonize. We need to do this aligned with science. <clears throat> Already inside of the Tourism Declares membership and inside of those who have signed the Glasgow Declaration are a host of different private sector bodies and destinations. Pretty well, whoever is working in tourism, someone has committed, some part of that sector is engaged. And of course, we need many, many more coming forward, sharing their examples, sharing their challenges, so that we truly can understand what the complexity looks like and work together. We have this incredible opportunity to regenerate, which can boil down to the opportunity for tourism to help our visitors and our host communities experience better balance with nature. In the end, we call it the climate emergency. We call it the biodiversity emergency. But the emergency is that human beings are not living in balance with nature. And when we can shift that, we address pretty well every other problem there is. We learn to live in a more harmonious way. And tourism that takes us into these places that are better experiences when they are wonderful is in an ideal situation to make that happen. I think I've made this point very clearly and everyone makes this point. We have to do this together. We have to collaborate. And finally, we have to ensure the finance is all very well to draw up a plan, but it can't just be a plan that gets dusty on a shelf. We have to ensure that every organization from every, from the smallest to the largest has the resources and capacity to meet the objectives that they set out. So what did we do? Finally, it took us two years to get to 390 or so members. The Glasgow Declaration has been live for a week. We now have 300 already signed. The more that come forward, the more that sign as quickly as possible, the more that bring in their experience and their knowledge, the faster we will get there. And we might be looking at 2030 and turning around and saying, we did it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Always inspiring to hear you tell how Tourism Declares emerged so passionately and uh, bringing such a logic to all the pathways um, as you just did. It was really useful to hear about the pathways that the Glasgow Declaration is proposing. And I'm sure that many of uh, those in the audience today are already delivering activities uh, under one of the pathways. And it would be great to hear about this later in the interactive uh, session. Uh, I'd like to to shift the focus uh, now a little bit, uh, or to deepen the focus, sorry, in in on Scotland. Uh, our COP26 uh, hosts um, visit Scotland was actually the first national tourism organisation in the world to declare a climate emergency, and is now uh, well underway in delivering a range of uh, activities. So I'd like to give the floor to Janie, Janie Neumann. She's uh, the sustainability manager at, uh, at Visit uh, Scotland. So she can give us a, an overview of uh, Destination Net Zero project. Janie, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Virginia. And yes, thank you, Jeremy, for that. Um, that very inspirational speech and I'm very excited to be here today and, and to talk a little bit more about catalyzing a destination. Um, before we get started, I just want to provide a little bit more background information on, on, on Visit Scotland's journey to where we are now and where we're at. So obviously now COP26 right now, right here and speaking to you from Glasgow in Scotland. Um, and this is a key moment in the fight against climate change, but also an opportunity for ourselves and tourism in general to step up and take action. 
and we recognize that. Um, and a year ago, we were the first national tourism organization to join Tourism Declares, really to, to showcase our ambition, as well as to start working with um, in collaboration with national and international partners. And off the back of some of that co collaboration with some of the key partners here today, we were very fortunate to be involved as members of the drafting committee for the Glasgow Declaration, which um, as you know, has been launched this morning, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and this really sets us all up to inspire um, and engage our visitors and our businesses to drive that action and kickstart that decade and, um, of climate action, which is necessary. And in Scotland here, we'll support those ambitious um, targets. So net zero by 2045 that you heard about before. And, and those targets really can draw a clear line through our Scotland Outlook 2030 tourism strategy, which is very much focused on make, delivering a responsible tourism for a sustainable future and the current tourism recovery plan. But um, we've, we're definitely developing more details around that, which I want to share with you. And, and transitioning to net zero is a journey, and it's a journey for all of us. Um, and, and so that's how, how we want to frame it, because it's important, a, a journey that everybody needs to go on, but people will be at different starting places and have different resources available, whether that's time, money, or knowledge. So to make sure that we all move in the right direction with the impact that we need to have, we really wanted to frame that journey around some key questions. So things around where are we now? So establishing that baseline, measuring and monitoring that will allow us to prioritize these actions and measure whether we're making progress. Um, where are we going? We have clear net zero targets, but it's also about seeing that, visualizing the low carbon um, tourism future and, and looking at some of that best practice and innovation already in place. How are we going to get there? There's some key actions we need to take. Um, but also, as we said before, it's important to acknowledge the barriers. What is stopping us? Is it a lack of awareness? Is it skills, um, money? Um, but also we found often it's the capacity. There's a lot of commitment from businesses to undertake action, but many businesses are small, medium-sized businesses um, that with all the pressures on them at the moment, find it difficult to find that time to take action and know where to start. So that's why providing them with advice and support um, on, on how to start, as well as the funding available and, and working together is key to take action. And you'll see how this um, overall journey aligns with the five pathways of the Glasgow Declaration. So just to briefly touch on some of the key areas that where we that we need to undertake to get there so to speak um clearly um our buildings and transport here in scotland we need to address as a priority with over 50 percent of territorial carbon emissions uh, coming from those areas so looking at energy efficiency and renewables as well as promoting walking and cycling and looking at electric vehicles and, and hydrogen as alternatives but especially in the tourism and hospitality sector considering the impact of food waste and the opportunity to offer more plant-based diets um, is also a great opportunity um, Scotland is um, has a particularly ambitious target of 2045 because we're uniquely placed um, to reforest and for peatland conservation as well. So that's something that the tourism industry can either get involved in or also support charities that do some wonderful work here. And adaptation is a topic that's sometimes not an easy one to talk about, but it's important that we um, support businesses and our destinations and acknowledging the unavoidable um, impacts of climate change that will happen and, and the risks that it will bring, but also to acknowledge potential opportunities. So the Destination Net Zero program that was mentioned before is um, worth almost four million a support program that's part of the overall Scottish Government COVID tourism recovery package worth 25 million. But these four million are really focused to support uh, tourism businesses and destinations to kickstart their journey to net zero. And they have four key areas. So as we said, the how are we going to, uh, you know, where are we now, that research and insights piece. So we're undertaking some research um, with the University of Queensland um, to establish that, those Scottish baseline emissions for the tourism sector to know where we're starting from. But also crucially, asking industry, let's find out from industry where they are at in their journey to net zero, where they get their advice, and what kind of advice they need and what their barriers are. And again, communicating and, and raising awareness 
and engaging all our partners through our online portal, as well as a, a range of program of support, which we'll be delivering with partners we have in Scotland to leverage all the existing advice. Supporting places, the destinations that are key in Scotland is important, for example, through a destination climate action leaders pilot that will be launching soon and supporting businesses very specifically on their carbon reduction projects, installing EV charge points and reducing their food waste and joining sustainable tourism certification. So these are all particular actions that um, we're looking to kickstart this decade of action, but and I can only repeat everybody else's words in saying that collaboration is key to take action. And here in Scotland, by no means are we the only ones. We're very lucky to have a very supportive Scottish government and the funding, but we're working with a wide range of partners across Scotland and the industry. Um, and, and I can only reiterate that the, the communication and collaboration is key and that the sharing our story and, and all the other stories we will hear today are fundamental to learn from each other and to, to you know, and not just share the highlights, but also the detours and the delays and the things that did or didn't work. And then we can all really make progress at the pace and scale that's necessary. And because tourism is a force for good and we can really um, appreciate that and we can also make our mark in this fight against climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. Uh, I could not agree more on the need to, to collaborate uh, and share successes and also learnings so that we really can advance uh, jointly. It was really great to see how you mapped um, the journey uh, for the tourism sector towards uh, net zero and also to see the, the, the partnership, uh, how it's working in partnership and uh, obviously, of course, the commitment of the government uh, when it comes to, to funding in order to, to support the green recovery. So thank you so much for that great presentation. With help from Laura and, and, and Keith, it would be great to, to see uh, a video that we have actually received from Gonzalo Muñoz. Gonzalo Muñoz is uh -huh. a UN climate champion uh, for Chile, you know, under the race uh, to zero. And uh, yeah, they were quite happy about the Glasgow Declaration, so uh, we're wanting to participate and we can hear what they have to say. Firstly, I would like to thank all of you so much for having me here today. It's a real honor to be speaking to all of you during COP26 in Glasgow on this very important agenda for sustainable tourism. Thank you to Visit Scotland, Tourism Declares, a Climate Emergency, Nestor and the Future of Tourism Coalition for organizing this event. Events like this are key to driving even more collaboration and more importantly action to building a low carbon resilient and healthy future for all. It's only through radical, through radical collaboration that we will definitely achieve our goals. And this is particularly important in the travel and tourism sector, given the complexity with multiple subsectors all around the world. It's such a granular uh, and, 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 and distributed and diverse sector, uh, and as well as the size of the sector, where the WTTC found that in 2019, the sector contributed to 10.4% of global GDP. So it, it means a lot in terms of how many people are, are uh, connected to the sector, how diverse it is in terms of big multinationals and, and very small uh, tourist, tourism operators, for example, then of course, it goes from, uh, uh, of course, uh, airlines or, 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 or transport systems to, of course, um, destinations. It can be either a camping or a resort or a hotel. So, yeah, and we know as well that the, the sector means so much in terms of not only GDP, but also in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So thank you all. Uh, for coming together to catalyze action across travel and tourism. As the, one of the two, two United Nations high-level climate action champions, uh, we warm, warmly welcome the Glasgow Declaration that was launched earlier today. This is a pivotal step in bringing together the sector to align with our goals of having emissions by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2050 at the latest. We will work very closely with this network of organizations to continue aligning the Glasgow Declaration with Race to Zero. When ready, we'll support the network's application to the XPP review group and hope that they will become the Race to Zero Partners Initiative for the travel and tourism sector. 
Thank you again for all the work you're doing and, and for having me today. I really look forward to seeing the action that will be driven by this collaboration and the Glasgow Declaration. As many of you know, this is something in, in it's a topic in which I put in a lot of personal energy and passion because I so well understand the impact that you drive and how much of that impact must be all about sustainability, all about climate positive, uh, positive all about regeneration, all about building resilience for so, so many people all around the world. Thanks so much. It is now, uh, it's on the theme of partnership, actually, that I'd like to introduce our next uh, speaker. He is Manuel Alejandro Cardenete, the president of uh, Nextour, a network of uh, 39 tourism authorities across uh, Europe committed to sustainable development as a way of increasing destination competitiveness. Okay, thank you, Virginia. Thank you for, for, the, for giving the floor and thank you for your passion and um, for the rest of, of the conferences. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in this collaborative event. Uh, we have been organizing together with Visit Scotland, Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency and the Travel Foundation, of course with the valuable support of the UNWTO. It's, a, it's an, an honor for next tour for us to stand today together with these three organizations that are building up an historical momentum for the global travel and tourism industry, calling for the recon recognition of tourism as a contributor to net zero targets, and most importantly, giving us a common framework uh, which is to set up our action the Glasgow Declaration, a commitment to a decade of tourism climate action. What is Nextur? It's something that probably you are asking. Nextur is a network for European regions for competitive and sustainable tourism. Nextur is the represent 39 official tourism authorities across Europe, including 15 of the 20 most visited regions in the European Union. All those regions representing the diversity of the European destination profiles. Our strategy is aligned to the European Twin Transition for uh, one of them, the Green and Digital, the, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Barcelona Declaration Better Place to Live and Visit. We have all a shared commitment on sustainability as a driver for community building, build by, sorry, well-being. People, our residents, environmental protection and restoration, planet, our destination, and competitiveness, prosperity, our business. This is why we believe together we can contribute to generate the impact that the climate emergency requires across the European territory. Almost four months ago, we declared a uh, climate emergency during the Tourism Declarations Initiative. We wanted, to, we wanted to acknowledge uh, three main things. First of all, that tourism is a contributor to the climate change. That tourism is an industry that stands to be adversely affected by climate change. And finally, tourism can be part of the solution, not of the problem, part of the solution. Our declaration was released exactly the same day that the European Commission approved the Fit for 50, 55, sorry, package under European Green Deal. We wanted to demonstrate our commitment and support for Europe's target of becoming the world's first climate neutral continent. For us, the world's first climate neutral destination. But we also wanted to position tourism's role in accelerate those efforts. While this commitment, commitment is crucial, it's nothing without the action and delivery. As a network, and I'm proud to share that next tour is rooted in the delivery of action that supports sustainable tourism, sorry, sustainable destination development since the beginning of our existence. Our journey started 15 years ago and today reaches a key milestone with our partners. Our General Assembly formally validated our subscription, subscription sorry, to the Glasgow Declaration as we were defining that main lines of our climate action plan. This plan will be ready by July 2022. It will include concrete targets and deliverables 
which we will implement and catalyze in partnership. We knew that this represented the real before and after moment for our network. Where to start? First of all, knowledge. Existing already in our network, sharing the experience of our members that are already taking action to reduce emissions in tourism and pulling knowledge to maximize their impact and encourage uh, others to follow. Second point, advocacy. Towards our regions and also towards to the European Union. Nexur is proud to be part uh, of the so-called transition pathway for a more resilient, innovative and sustainable tourism ecosystem, which is the process led by European Commission to build the future European agenda for the tourism of tomorrow. In this framework, we share the voice of the European regions and have the opportunity to advocate for tourism being a key driver of the European Green Deal by taking inspiration from the pathways of the Glasgow Declaration. We firmly believe that unless travel and tourism are not part of the European Green Deal, we fear that near zero targets will not be met. Third point, cooperation with our European and global partners. Joining the Glasgow Declaration, the Global Tourism Plastics Initiative and the Future of Tourism Coalition provide us a guidance for the, Europe the development and implementation of our climate action plan. So an example can illustrate this point. First of all, boosting the integration of tourism in the existing regional climate action plans, which are most then non-sectorial. Second point, stimulating cooperation with the departments of regional government that hold responsibility for environmental climate wasted management, water management, mobility, something crucial to reach our industry net zero targets. Third, third example, integrating the participation of citizens to define climate action investment. For example, raising awareness with tourism destination. Fifth example, transferring the regional sustainable mobility strategy in the travel and tourism sector. And finally, identifying indicators to measure carbon footprint in our destination, as well as mitigations result. This means that our climate action plan will allow, will allow us to scale up existing and successful experience for our members and partners. To this end, we'll take advantage next, of next tour a strategic alliance partnered at, bo at both European and global levels, starting by Visit Scotland, Tourism Declaration, the Triumph Foundation, and of course, the UNWTO. As newly president, elected president of Next Tour, it, it is my challenge and privilege to help drive forward our strategic goals in collaboration with our members and partners. We have demonstrated our own value and resilience as a network during the COVID crisis. I'm trying to end, it's time, it's, it's the same spirit of adaptation and collaboration that we need to take our net zero targets. Our motto in next tour is go, go, go further when we go together. And I feel it's now very relevant, relevant than ever. Delivering solution requires a global effort and next tour is committed to being a key player to this in this opportunity. We look forward to sharing our progress with you as much as to learn from you as well uh, a way we can catalyze and accelerate our efforts leading to a net zero tourism future for our places and for our people. Thank you so much, Virginia. Virginia, I'm sorry for my the way that I have started. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Mr. Cardenete, not to worry uh, at all. It was uh, fantastic uh, to hear you uh, tell us how Next Tour is uh, actually so committed to taking action. And, and thank you so much for, for your leadership. It's, I think it's really a great model, very influential, uh, sharing the expertise, insights and, and good practices of of your members to, to build a climate action plan and, and then using this to support so many destinations across Europe as they accelerate their efforts to towards net zero. So this morning we had the European Commission in the panel uh, at the COP and I really think Next Tour can play a, a key role uh, 
uh, as you say, uh, making that the Green Deal is really a green tourism uh, deal. So looking forward to, to collaborating, of course, uh, on, on that front. Thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> we have, uh, I mean, we have had wonderful welcome remarks. Then we've learned about the declaration. We've also learned how to catalyze a destination, Scotland, in this case. And now we've heard uh, Mr. Cardenete speaking about catalyzing a continent uh, and, and collaborating for change. So I think it's now time to, to switch to the second uh, part of uh, our session today, which is the, the panel uh, discussions. Um, so, um, I'm really pleased to be joined by a wonderful uh, lineup of, of speakers, uh, our panelists uh, today, and I invite them all to turn on their, their cameras now, please. So our, our panelists represent uh, really um, a range of destination types. We have a country, we have a region, we have a city, we have a national park, islands and a coastline. Uh, so very diverse, but at the end of the day, all of them very, very much linked by a strategic focus on responsible development and, and a commitment to, to New Zero. So thanks to all for accepting the invitation to, to be a panelist uh, today. Uh, an announcement for the audience. Uh, please note that this session is not open to questions and answers uh, from the audience. You will have the opportunity to ask uh, questions later in the open forum that follows uh, the panel. In any, in any way, if you wish to post something in the chat, as I said in the beginning, you are always uh, welcome to do so. So um, without further ado, it's, it's really our great pleasure to, to introduce uh, Senator uh, Lisa Cummins. Uh, she's uh, the Minister of Tourism and International Transport of the government of uh, Barbados. Barbados, excuse me, Minister, pleasure to have you with us. Then we have also uh, Murray Ferguson, Director of Planning and Place at the Cairngorms National Park Authority. This is the largest uh, national park in Scotland. We have also with us Maria Linde. This is Deputy CEO in West Sweden Tourism Board. Ika Sears, Deputy Director at the Oregon Coast Visitors Association and Jos Franken, CEO of the Netherlands uh, Board of Tourism and uh, Conventions. So really a pleasure to, to have you all. Um, what I have planned for the session uh, today is a couple questions that I will uh, ask you all to, to reply, uh, as I think you will provide uh, to the same topic, different perspectives that, that can really uh, then lead us to a very rich discussion in the interactive session. So uh, the first question is um, related to, to the five pathways of the declaration, basically uh, thinking about the five pathways of, of the Glasgow declaration. Uh, I'd like to know what are the top two or three actions that your organization or destination is taking to, to support net zero uh, targets. And uh, I'd like to start uh, with you, Minister Excellency, you, uh, Senator, you have the, the floor, please. Thank you so much for, for, first of all, inviting me to join this panel today. I've been intrigued by the presentations which have gone before and they have shared really the standard that needs to be set for the tourism industry and uh, certainly from Barbados. Barbados is not just a tourism dependent economy, but we are equally a small island developing state. And so the issues on the agenda and those captured in the Glasgow Declaration, all five of the pathways are all critical for Barbados, both uh, on our receiving side, but also in terms of our partners and the countries around us and the commitments that they make. I'm gonna start first of all, perhaps by speaking to the question of measurement in the first instance, and the ability to be able to measure and to define the key elements that are affecting the tourism industry and then to further disaggregate those measurements into the different types of countries and how we are affected and so there are producers and then there are recipients then there, there are countries on the other side who are like Barbados and most of the countries in the Caribbean if not all of the countries in the Caribbean who are not necessarily contributing and who are measuring but we also need to measure both risk and the impact 
on our economies from these kinds of elements. And then the second uh, uh, part of it that I would want to speak to is a question of uh, providing financing and development support for the implementation of the mitigation and the adaptation strategies. This is absolutely critical. So renewable energy, use of water resources, especially for countries like ours, which are equally water scarce, and the preservation of our coastlines and our renewable sources of both water and, and of course, a generation of energy. Those are some of the key things that we would want to be able to participate in as part of the Glasgow Declaration and the pathways that have been outlined. Thank you so much uh, for such a very uh, clear uh, statement. Uh, May I now uh, prompt uh, Murai Ferguson, Murai, if you could uh, tell us what are the top or two or three actions that you would have in mind? Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks again for the invitation to be part of this event. Uh, Glasgow seems to be the centre of the world this week, so I should tell you that the Cairngorms National Park is located about three and a half hours to the north of Glasgow. And we are the largest national park in Scotland, but also uh, the largest of 15 in the UK. Uh, it's quite a large landscape. It includes about 6% of the Scottish landscape. Um, I think also the one I would pick up on is a measurement. Um, we are embar just embarked on a project of a, a carbon baseline assessment using a, a common methodology that we've developed uh, a, a, in common with the other 14 national parks in the United Kingdom. And we think that's going to be very, very useful to us because we are um, consulting at the moment on our draft climate action plan. And I'll put a link in the chat to that so that you can see it. And um, we're very willing to hear feedback on that up until about the 17th of de uh, December. Um, the other uh, pathway, and, and these are so useful, I think, to us to provide us with a framework that I would, I would comment on is the work on decarbonisation. Uh, we have a very exciting project uh, to, do, to deliver with partners over the next few years. We, we have been working to develop this for quite a, a while, um, but we effectively we have a £43 million project with 45 committed partners already signed up. And um, we only had the funding confirmed within the last few months. And that, from a tourism perspective, will see us um, connect our communities with really good paths so that when visitors do come here, um, they can travel in a, a, a much less carbon intensive way and enjoy the, the fantastic landscape. Uh, we also are going to be ex uh, expanding the forest resource within the park and looking after the peatlands. And we think that will have a double set of benefits in that it will reduce the, the carbon cycle, but it will also improve the landscape for visitors and thereby improve the visitor experience. So that's just a, a couple of examples. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Murai. I'm sure uh, quite inspiring also for other national uh, parks, all the actions that, that uh, you are taking. I've, I've just noticed, and I have to apologize that I missed introducing one of our, our panelists, actually, Katarina. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Katarina Thorstenson, she's a sustainability strategist at uh, Gothenburg and Co. Uh, Katarina, since uh, I'm now trying to fix what I <laughs> did before, can I ask you now about your actions? Which actions would you be wanting to yeah. highlight? Sure, no worries, Virginia. No worries at all. And thank you for inviting me, first of all, and also a big thank you for this initiative with the Glasgow Declaration. I believe this is so important to our industry to actually gather and get together uh, and collaborate on, on this important issue that uh, uh, affects us all, in a way. Uh, about the actions, uh, I would uh, also like to uh, say uh, some short words around measuring because I do think that is really, really important to move forward and to find a common framework for measuring as a DMO. For example, we, we are in the middle of looking at our own, mapping our uh, climate footprint uh, uh, in accordance to the GHG protocol. And when you come to scope three, for example, this gets really uh, wicked <laughs> in a way. So I would really, really, collaborate on uh, finding a common framework for for this uh, internationally. So measuring is one action that we are on. Uh, and then collaboration, being a DMO, uh, the stakeholder involvement and stakeholder engagement is core to us. 
So keeping engaging and involving and supporting the supplier side is uh, really key to us and listening to them. Um, as for today, the city of Gothenburg has around 90% of the hotels uh, with a third party environmental certification, uh, for example, that is one way to move forward. Our uh, transport system is uh, uh, working towards becoming climate neutral in a couple of years. Uh, so looking at the ecosystem, of course, and, and um, engaging them is, is key, but also on the other side, making it easy for the visitors and the locals to make sustainable choices uh, and show them uh, what they can choose uh, and what is good for, for the local community, of course. Um, I think Janie from Visit Scotland had a brilliant roadmap uh, for a destination. So thank you for that as well, Janie. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. <laughs> Amazing to see so, so much action taking, taking place. Um, I'd like now to invite uh, Maria Linde, please, Mary. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to this interesting and important event. It feels great to be part of, uh, of the network of organizations who are signing the declaration. Uh, I think the most important action that we have taken as an organization is that we have changed our whole way of working. We have put sustainability in the center of what we are doing. Uh, it's not about attracting as many visitors as possible. It's about making tourism as sustainable as possible in all three dimensions. And uh, we have realized very much in line with today's theme that if we want to make a change, we can't do it alone. We have to get the tourism companies and the public sector in West Sweden to work together. So what I would like to focus on is the issue of collaboration. Uh, we have developed a strategy that we call Stepping Up Sustainability where we now have 40 local authorities and 350 tourism companies that are all working together, taking steps in the right direction, sharing experiences with each other, encouraging each other uh, to do great efforts within sustainability. And what we also feel is not just about doing things, it's actually also about opting out of certain things. Uh, so just to give you a few examples, we don't market West Sweden outside of Europe anymore to in avoid encouraging long distance flights. Not to say that people from outside of Europe aren't welcome to West Sweden. Of course they are, but we don't market West Sweden outside of Europe. Uh, we don't market the places that we know are the most popular for tourists to, to visit to avoid over tourism. And that might uh, sound easy, but Actually, it's rather tempting to, to put those <laughs> most popular places in the marketing. Uh, what we also try to do is we try to get the visitors to come to West Sweden to stay as long as possible during their holiday to avoid unnecessary transportations. Those are just a few examples. Uh, we do a lot of other things. I thought it was very interesting to listen uh, to Janie from Visit Scotland because I recognize so many things uh, in, in what she said that we are doing as well. Uh, and I obviously don't have time to go into any details here, but we do have a website, steppingupsustainability.com, that you're very welcome to, to visit to see, uh, because there are so many good examples from the tourism companies in West Sweden sharing experiences. Thank you, Marie. We do have time, so these questions may come up in the open session. Huh? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's hear now from, from Arika, please, from Oregon Coast. Good morning from the Oregon Coast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I agree that it's so great having these pathways to look at and be able to talk about and just kind of actually worked in perfect order after listening to, uh, to Marie and Kat because I was going to talk about collaboration as well. I think that we often talk about collaboration as almost like this beautiful notion or something political to say, like, we should all work together. And, and that's true. And it is beautiful. But for a really small nonprofit like the Oregon Coast, we have to work together and we have to align resources because we don't have the staff capacity or funding to not do that. So a lot of our actions over the past several months have been really collaborating with state agencies here in Oregon, understanding what some upcoming plans are, you know, what 
what's our department of transportation planning to do around you know electric vehicles um what is what's our energy grid you know we're so fortunate in oregon that our energy grid should be clean energy by 2040 so we have these exciting opportunities and we love to be innovative, but we don't love to reinvent the wheel. So we've spent a lot of time in this collaboration phase, understanding what resources and programs already exist. And then we're taking all this information and hoping that we can distill it down for our smaller DMOs and chambers that exist in our region so that they don't have to spend so much time um, going through all these interviews and trying to wade through all this information. So we spent a lot of time in collaboration and our team is really excited about the decarbonized pathway. I think often as humans, um, when we think of change, we think of it as a negative thing. Maybe we're about to lose something when we change. Um, but we're actually with these decarbonization opportunities, we're adding things to our destination. And so our team's really excited about what, you know, what does it look like to add EV charging stations in front of businesses? Um, what does it look like to add extra stops, local stops in our supply chain and have that kind of product available for visitors, solar panels and public transit. So those are all additions to our destination that we're really excited about. So spending a lot of time in collaboration, really excited, excited about the decarbonization aspect. Thank you, Arika. Jos, I'd like to hear from you now, if, if you may. Yes, thank you very much, Virginia, and thank you for having us. I'm quite humbled, to be honest, to be in the presence of so many committed change agents, and I can only hope that the Netherlands will uh, will do you all proud in uh, in due time. Um, when it comes to uh, some examples, let me give you a few. Uh, when it comes to the pathway of uh, measurement, uh, it's, I guess, the returning subject uh, today. Uh, I see already uh, Megan Applewood also uh, stating that it's key to get to a common framework and I can only support that because also the Netherlands, like many uh, of us here today, are working uh, on, let's say, a new dashboard, new KPIs, new variables to monitor, to steer uh, and to be the basis and foundation for better policies and better action meaning that we move forward from just the economic, the traditional economic uh, variables to the ecological ones, but also the social ones. Uh, and it goes without saying that it's it's quite a challenge. Uh, the wheel is being reinvented, I guess, at many places around the globe. So if anything comes out of this today, uh, it would be fantastic that a few of us could come together and really set in motion the need for that common framework. It would be of tremendous help in steering this movement into the desired direction. When it comes to an example in collaboration, another key aspect, um, uh, I, I noticed that when in the Netherlands, it tends to be not the sexiest subject to talk about, but it's key uh, to progress. And that's a task force that is uh, uh, put in place as a result of COVID, so apart from the social, economic and health crisis that COVID uh, put upon us, uh, some of the things that came out of it are actually pretty interesting. In the Netherlands, it means there's now for the first time ever a task force where national government, provincial government and local governments sit together with the industry, with the knowledge institutions and ourselves to steer the future and sustainable development of Destination Netherlands, which is fantastic. Is it effective as it could be, as it should be? No, it isn't yet, uh, but it's a, a table, it's a setup where all the relevant partners are uh, in place and working together towards a sustainable future, which I guess is a, a great breeding ground for uh, everything we would like to do as part of this declaration. And a few practical examples, be it in the decarbonization or regeneration uh, pathways, is for example, uh, providing a guide to sustainable tourism in the national parks in the Netherlands, uh, really helping them to develop a sustainable tourism strategies, um, uh, putting the, the communities in the center of, uh, of these strategies, but also, and that won't come as a surprise, being the biking country in the world, although the Danes would, be, would uh, challenge this, of course, um, is that being a bike country, we really would like to see uh, our, our uh, key position being strengthened by uh, evolving the infrastructure to accommodate the e-bike more sufficiently 
uh, which is fantastic because the e-bike isn't just a wonderful way to explore the Netherlands in a decarbonized way, but it also increases people's action radius so they can actually explore more before their bum becomes, uh, starts to hurt from the saddles for those who are not used to ride a bike. So uh, plenty to do. Uh, uh, these are just a few examples that we would like to uh, progress on. Thank you so much. Um, just you have um, highlighted how important important sorry is uh, to collaborate across the different uh, stakeholders and and levels of of government. Um, I think this is a persisting challenge, and that's why I'm really happy that we have it now as a pathway to remind us all. Uh, that we need to to collaborate. I, I'd like to ask a question to to the minister, actually, uh, with regards to how things are happening in the governing the government of of Barbados in in this regard. I mean, do do you get the necessary support from the uh, other ministries that are also looking at at climate change and how is interministerial uh, coordination? Uh, pr producing, uh, I'm sure it's not not an easy task. I, I, I'd also, um, if you can um, maybe share with us a bit, how do you interact with, with the industry? So how are you really putting the glue uh, in between all the stakeholders so that the climate action we are committed to, to deliver can, can actually take place? Well, thanks for asking that, Virginia. I think it's a really important question. What we're doing in Barbados and our prime minister, as you know, she's been in Glasgow and she's been speaking on a number of these issues. And we have a combination of our environmental, environmental protection teams, our climate teams, but also our economic and finance teams. Because let's be honest about this here. We are a tourism dependent economy. And if we think about what has happened in the last 18 to 22 months or so, uh, we have had approximately 87% of our annual income taken from the country as a result of the decline in international travel and the impact on the tourism economy. We have had a decline. 40% of our annual GDP is derived from tourism and about 40%, if not higher, of our labor force works in a tourism economy. And so when you have a, a, a sector that drives your entire economy and your society together, the impact is significant when you have to make changes or when the last two years almost have happened. And so we don't have the luxury as a small island developing state of state of diversifying into high-end manufacturing as is the case in many other countries. We do not have food security because we don't have large tracts of land for the production of agriculture and so on. And so tourism is very much our mainstay and being able to do so sustainably is a matter of life or death for us. And so all across our government agencies in every single ministry, the question of sustainability is being treated to. So for example, in our public transportation system, we have recently transitioned within the last two years to a largely electronic vehicle fleet. Previously, we had these diesel guzzling public service vehicles that you would hear coming a mile off and they would be traversing the streets and locals and visitors alike took that as public transportation. Now we have almost flipped the script and the majority of our public transportation is electric. We were one of the very first countries in the world and we've been overtaken by many others subsequently in developing solar panels for electric water, for, for water heating purposes. So nearly every house at the highest level of income to the lowest level of income, most likely you're going to see a solar water heating a unit on that roof. And we've evolved over time. So there's solar farms and we're seeing a lot more of the renewable energy unfolding over time. But the element, and I spoke earlier about the uh, importance of finance for us as one of the pathways. We, at the start of the pandemic, in order to focus on the development of the tourism sector, as we went through the pandemic, we developed a program which was around $300 million of an investment. And a significant percentage of that across public and private sector, across all agencies, including finance, economic, economic affairs, tourism, and so on, was the introduction of what we call environmentally sustainable and transformative investments. And that included things like waste management, water management, wastewater treatment plants uh, being put into our hotels, solarization and digitalization as well. So all of those are key elements that go into our net zero uh, targets and our cross agency collaboration. But for us, we don't have the luxury of treating to it just as a collaborative event. 
we don't have the alternatives in terms of sectoral development. We don't derive large amounts of revenue from other sources. And so tourism being sustainable for us is absolutely a critical part of our growth and development strategy, and it is across all of our agencies. Thank you very much, Minister, for sharing all those uh, insights. I, I really hope they can inspire many others to, to follow suit. Um, I'd like to ask a question to, to Murai now. Um, actually, um, let's say, if you were to uh, discuss with uh, fellow national parks and you were to recommend to them how to start national parks that are still not in, embarked on climate action, what could be the low hanging fruit if we can find any low hanging fruit in terms of climate action for national parks? Uh, well, I think most of my colleagues in national parks, are, are, they are already working on this. Um, I think in the Cairngorms, we are fortunate in that the whole model of a national park we've got is very much based on collaboration. We're, we're unusual in that I work for the National Park Authority, which is the overarching government body responsible, but we don't actually own or directly manage any of the land in this enormous landscape. 75% uh, of the land is owned privately and the rest is owned by charities or um, other, other government bodies. And that means that we can place our emphasis on trying to encourage everyone to work together and spotting the projects that are not happening, etc. Um, I think, I think uh, thinking of tourism issues, the opportunity we've got in national parks is to address the climate challenge alongside the biodiversity challenge, which is undoubtedly facing us, and also to capitalise on the goodwill and good sentiment that people have when they visit these special landscapes. You know, these are these are inspirational times in people's lives. So we really need to rise to the challenge and use that sentiment in order to take the, the, the population with us. And, and I'm sure my, my colleagues in other national parks are, are aware of that too. Thanks, thanks, Mura. Indeed, I mean, biodiversity loss is uh, like another uh, of the greatest uh, challenges that humanity is uh, facing these days. So uh, really inspirational job. And I would say even front runners uh, with capability of influencing the whole of a destination and also changing behavior by providing those experiences uh, in, in nature. So thanks uh, for sharing. Um, next question is a bit more technical for, for Katarina, since you were mentioning scope three. <laughs> um, I'd be curious to, to learn uh, how are those discussions happening at, at the destination level? Like when you think about a scope three, how are the debates, uh, you know, producing? What, what, how would you, let's say, roughly define your scope three, if, if that's possible as of, of today? Well, actually, we are in the middle of this, as I wrote in the chat, uh, the uh, um, it's a bumpy road, uh, finding the the sort of um, right scope and then also getting the data. Uh, so looking both upstream and downstream, and we're we are starting with the DMO as an organization. Uh, so we don't have full uh, sort of control of every supplier on the destination and what the individual tourists make, um, what kind of choices they make. So we are still really, really struggling. Uh, so what I believe or would, what I would like is both to do the DMO, the organizational mapping, and then also look at the, the map of the destination uh, in some rough way, uh, I, I don't have the answers and we're, it's really trial and error and sort of testing things. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to your question, <laughs> not more than it's a bumpy road and we're, we're sort of finding a way forward. Thank you, Katarina. Sorry, to, maybe I've been a bit no, tricky. No, no. Actually, I, I don't think anybody has the answer yet at, no. at destination level. It's really something that we all have to prioritize. And yeah. as you say, trial and error, so we can really come up with a methodology that that works and mm. avoid you know, duplications uh, as much as possible. So I really think we, we should all take this as, yeah, as really also, a, a priority. Sorry. Uh, and also to find sort of a decent level so where you can get the data that is uh, uh, manageable 
uh, and easy to get. So you don't put all your money and your efforts in trying to find the nitty gritty things, but actually measuring the important uh, streams. Uh, so it, it's really it's really hard to find this level uh, that is uh, workable in many ways. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Maria, I like very much the, the, how you echoed the promotion and uh, how you are promoting and not promoting your <laughs> destination because it's something that, I mean, we've been reflecting about as promotion is the, we could say, the traditional competence of all ministries uh, of, of tourism. Do, would you say this is really a lever for the sector to, to accelerate climate action, that we could influence marketing and promotion strategies? Yes, I think it is. And also in the way that we can influence during what time of the year uh, the tourists come to us, uh, that we don't just uh, bring more tourists during the high seasons. Uh, so I think marketing is a very, very much a key issue here, how we handle that and what target groups we attract. Um, so, yeah, it's very much in the center of, of what we're doing and what we're choosing not to do. Thank you so much. Arika, have you also reflected about possibilities to transform promotion and, and marketing? Did, did this happen uh, to pop up in any of your internal debates? Yeah, I think that the way that we market and talk about our destinations is always important, even just in destination management, when we have some of these over tourism issues, right, we start doing that as well, distributing visitors to lesser known places or lesser used places. Um, but I think we do have a lot of opportunity uh, on the Oregon coast and in the state of Oregon, we have a lot of local food trails. So we have these itineraries of restaurants and food places that are using locally sourced food. Um, so when we're marketing, it's really interesting to market organizations like that because their supply chains are a lot smaller, their impacts, their carbon footprint is a lot smaller, they're supporting local farmers and producers. So I think that we can really look at what we're marketing and really highlight those, those types of experiences that are local and those types of food that are also using locally sourced. So I think there is some really exciting opportunities there. And we've been talking about um, uh, you know, electric vehicle, the electric highway along the entire West Coast of the United States, Washington, Oregon, California, how exciting that would be. Um, we have to fill a few gaps in, <laughs> so that there's enough chargers to make that a doable trip. Um, but again, I think there are a lot of exciting experiences that we could be talking about and highlighting in our, our marketing channels. Thank you, Erika. Uh, any reflections from, from your side? Uh, just maybe with regards to to measurement and uh, let's say how what would you recommend to uh, your peers that have not started in the journey to to discuss first? Well, I, I think it's key to to start to sing from the same hymn sheet, if you like, uh, within your destination. I think in the Netherlands we used a vision ambition on 2030 perspective 2030 as a starting point pre-COVID, thank God, uh, because also now uh, coming out of COVID, it acts like a, like, a, like a guiding principle for sustainable recovery as a basis for sustainable development of our, of our nation. Um, and what we see happening, which is fantastic, that regions, cities, villages, entrepreneurs are, are sort of uh, looking at the future based on the guiding principles, uh, uh, similar to, to the pathways of the declaration in a way, uh, for their policy making, which is important, we feel, because you start to speak the same language. And by speaking the same language, you sort of can, uh, uh, well, make cooperation a little less difficult, if you like. Um, very much trial and error, I recognize that. Um, but I think it all starts with uh, sharing the same ambition and vision on the future and starting to, to use the same guiding principles for everyone to work on, be it that every city or region, even in a small country like the Netherlands, will have to translate these guiding principles to their own specific circumstances, because Amsterdam is no Rotterdam, Rotterdam is not a national park. Uh, so. The small we are, 
every city, nation, region needs to adopt and translate it to their own needs and to their own ambitions. What we try to do is that the Netherlands as a destination at the end of the day is not the sum of its individual parts, but that by speaking and singing the same language, uh, we really sort of make sure that uh, uh, the whole is better and more effective uh, in terms of uh, sustainable development than that sum of its individual parts. And it's work in progress. We, we've only started. Um, um, and I think, uh, like discussed before, and uh, I see Megan being a, a strong advocate of that in the chat, is what would really be nice is if those who are at the forefront of developing new parameters, new variables, that somehow uh, there's plenty of tables that people uh, gather around, uh, but we really, I would really support a table, uh, maybe coming out of this initiative, where those who are at the forefront of creating these new variables, new parameters, new KPIs, uh, would come together, share, learn from each other, and together sort of try to develop that uh, common framework that we can all use for our future uh, uh, actions. Thank you so much, Joss, and looking forward. Uh, we're coming to the end of the panel, but uh, before we close, I'd like to ask all of you again one uh, question to be answered rapidly. Um, basically, if we are, we're always looking at the future, but if we are to look further uh, at the future, um, what would be an important action that you think you should be looking at, but you're still not? It's my tricky afternoon. Sorry for. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Something, or maybe you you oh. have a clear uh, picture of what you should be doing, but you haven't not been able because you are not enabled for reason A, B, or C. This is also a possible answer. Okay, Katarina, please go ahead. Uh, well, actually, I think that. Uh, Digging into what digitalization can do to help out uh, to find solutions and also to find where to put in the best measures. Uh, I think that's uh, something that is up and coming and that where, where our industry should be a bit further uh, on. Uh, and we are trying to explore that area actually we've just only started but i do think that digitalization and sustainability will help us um, on this journey towards 2030 and beyond thank you thank you very very good point uh, katarina because actually um, let's say that the the few examples that we know now of destinations uh, that have measured are in many occasions linked to, to dig digital tools. So it would be good to explore that a little bit more in depth to see how we can become maybe more efficient and enabled. Murray, floor is yours. I think, I think that's a, a very challenging question because we're all, uh, we're just embarking on the next five to seven year cycle of planning and there is so much change that we are all facing. It's, re it's very challenging for all of the stakeholders to deal with even that. But uh, I, I think from a tourism perspective, looking even further ahead, the biggest issue for us, which is slightly beyond our direct influence, is this issue of how visitors get to the national park. You know, we're a rural area. We know that at the moment, before COVID, about 90% of the visitors were still arriving here by car. Now, even with electrification, that's not a very desirable thing. We'd far rather people were coming in other forms of public transport, but that's a really significant challenge for us. So that's probably, from a tourism perspective, I think that is probably the single biggest issue. Thank you, Marie. Uh, yes, I think uh, when it comes to collaboration that I was talking about before, I think it's uh, a major challenge to get what we have started to continue, so to keep up the pace, to ensure that both our organisation and the tourism businesses in West Sweden are not satisfied with what they've already done, but that we are taking constantly new steps in the right direction. Uh, and, and to uh, make sure that we as an organisation really stick to those principles that we have set up for ourselves. 
Thank you, Mary. Very, very important uh, point. Arika. Oh, good. I'm glad you put me before Joe so he can uh, uh. really <laughs> up our conversation. <laughs> You know, the, what came to mind for me was is finance. And I know that I'm sure that every small nonprofit DMO that's listening to this right now is probably thinking the same thing is how do we finance these actions? And currently the way we're financed is from tourism, from the tourists that visit us. But how can we get financing from this that doesn't come from tourism, from the tourists themselves? Like Marie was saying, having more tourists might not be our uh, our goal anymore. Uh, and Lisa was saying, too, how do we make this sustainable? So looking at funding resources that aren't necessarily coming from the tourists so that we can support the tourists that is coming and the destinations that are supporting them. Um, that's, you know, a big future question and solution to look for for us. Thank you, Arika. I'll invite Josh now, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess, to be honest, I, I, I'd like to keep it small. Well, small, that's being a relative term, but close to our own heart is that uh, having now signed up, uh, we really need to challenge ourselves and our partners, uh, and this is an open invitation, um, is that we really start looking at this subject uh, by default and by design. Because in all honesty, it's a bit like innovation. It, it, it's sort of, we have to prevent that it's becoming a project uh, because it isn't. Uh, and I feel strongly about the fact that we really need to take the sustainable development of our, of our country, uh, also in the capacity of a destination, uh, uh, by default and by design in everything and anything we do, rather than having a project manager run it as being a project, because uh, God forbid that others may think that they don't have to do anything with it. Um, so that, I guess, is our personal challenge within our own organization and hopefully have that uh, trans uh, projected on our partners who I hope will join us in this uh, in this very important but also uh, uh, wonderful uh, opportunity. Thanks, Jos. I, I think it's our lifetime project, actually. I hope we manage to implement it successfully altogether. Uh, climate action. Uh, Lisa, I left you for the end. I wanted you to oh. have the perspectives from, from the colleagues uh, before you can share with us your views. Uh, well, thank you. I actually agree with all of the points made by the colleagues, but certainly I'm going to speak again as a small island developing state, and, state and, and our issue is connectivity. Uh, interestingly, during the pandemic, when borders were closed and when uh, subsequently you had difficulties even with travel, we were completely cut off from the world because it meant that there was no way to get to us. And that impacted not just the movement of people, but the movement of cargo and goods and critical supplies that our people needed, included food, including food. And so there's a lot of work that typically still needs to be done. And we have not gotten involved in it because we don't have an airline industry, but certainly in aviation, international aviation, that's a huge contributor uh, to the conversation on sustainability and tourism and CO2 emissions and so on. But we as small island developing states have not gotten involved in that conversation except in a tangential way. But we do have to get involved. We do have to get actively involved because it's not just the question of the emissions and the sustainability issues, but for us, it is a critical issue of connectivity. We're not on a continent, so you can't get to us by train. And uh, you, you kind of can't ride a bike either to get to Barbados. And so we need to be able to integrate both land-based connectivity issues as well as international connectivity uh, for the purpose of small island developing tourism dependent economies as part of the sustainable solutions for our sector. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Very pertinent uh, point, especially for uh, island states. Um, I think we've had really a lot of interesting inputs from our panelists. I think they've managed to outline uh, many uh, ways that one can be enabled to advance the different uh, pathways. It's not going to be an easy route, but we are, can make it if we are working together on this. I'm, I'm really convinced and I thank you all very much. Uh, looking forward to continuing collaborating with, with you all. Thank you.
I was in a live event this morning, so I, I really realized that I missed clapping. <laughs> so I encourage you all to really applaud our panelists. OK, and now um, I'm lucky now I'm getting some support actually from uh, dear colleague Ben Lynam. He's the head of communications from the Travel Foundation. Uh, we'll be together moving on uh, into the interactive uh, forum. So as promised in the beginning, this is the time where all of you can um, in the audience can raise the hand. Tell us what you think, if you have any particular comments or questions. And uh, I think, Ben, you've been uh, monitoring um, a bit the chat and also the hands and, and so on. So I, I let you guide me. How, how do you think we should proceed if we have any volunteers already wanting to speak? Hi, hi, Virginia. Thanks. And uh, yeah, the um, I, I'm sure you've all been following the chat, um, which has been really good. And and obviously, please keep the chat coming uh, as we enter this um, uh, phase. But um, if you can find the um, the little button um, with a kind of a hand like that at the top for um, anyone who would like to make uh, any kind of contribution, question, or or statement, uh, then we'll be um, inviting you to speak. Um, I think um, first of all, um, Jose Luis uh, Wagner was um, first up um, actually um, some time uh, ago, um, I believe uh, from the Balearics perhaps, and so perhaps we could um, uh, um, invite uh, him to speak. Yeah, Ben, sounds like a, sounds like a good idea. Let's, uh, let's hear from the Balearic Islands then. I, I didn't get the name, sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organization of the event opportunity to be in the part of it. Um, I will be brief uh, during my inter intervention. As you probably know, Valencia region is a well-known Mediterranean tourist destination in Europe. In fact, uh, until the pandemic caused by the COVID-19, more than 9 million international tourists visited uh, us each year, and more than 15 million people in Spain choose us to enjoy their holidays in our region. As a member of, as a member region of Nestur, we are committed to, to the fight against fight against climate change, climate change uh, through tourism. Therefore, Valencia region has produced a handbook for a tourist destination to support their adaptation to climate change and to take action toward emergency climate emergency. I will share the link to, to the document in the chat. In this round, uh, we have two questions to the speakers. Uh, we really think that the mitigation adaptation and measures are about uh, needed to when addressing climate change. And so uh, the first one is how is adaptation integrated in a tourist climate action plan? And the second one is what kind of measures besides handbooks, capacity building can be done to improve the adaptation to climate change? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose Luis. By the way, Jose Luis is from Valencia, not Baleares, so east coast of Spain, but still in the in the land in the country is not an island. Sorry for that, uh, Jose Luis. I, I misunderstood in the beginning. Who wants to volunteer to reply to Jose Luis in the panel? So adaptation. How do we integrate adaptation in in climate action uh, plans and also uh, capacity building related uh, question? Okay, maybe. Um, because I think I'll ask, uh, if you don't mind, Lisa, uh, because you mentioned in the beginning of your uh, statement that it would also be important to look at risks uh, and impacts. And actually, I see this very connected with adaptation, especially in an island state. Do you have uh, these uh, references in, in your planning, in your strategies? Do you have both the elements of decarbonization as well as adaptation? Absolutely. We have um, adaptation has been long standing for us. I think over many, many years, Barbados has had a strong voice in the United Nations in particular, uh, in using the UNFCC as the base in baseline. If you recall, in 1994, Barbados would have hosted the first small island developing states at uh, the Sustainable Development Conference. And from as far back as 1994, we have been talking about the issues of mitigation and adaptation and how those things are specifically linked to small island developing states. So you would have seen us 
in subsequent years at the level of the United Nations introduced things like the Caribbean Sea as a special area in the context of sustainable development. And why was that important? That was important because when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about sea level rise and the impact on coastal communities. And when we talk about coastal communities, we're talking about things like pollution and fisheries and, and obviously beaches, which are heavily used for tourism, and of course, construction along your coastline. So we have always integrated into our development planning, and which is globally known as the Barbados Plan of Action, the issues of sustainability, uh, adaptation, and mitigation. But we're very clear that having moved from 1994 to 2021 and looking forward to 2030, there is still so much more that is needed than what we have already done. And the questions of how do we achieve the targets that we have set for ourselves and how do we go beyond those targets? That is very much where we are now in this moment. And then I think in terms of some of the additional mitigation examples that we've used, Barbados has just, uh, over the last few years started a tree planting initiative and we're aiming also to plant a million trees as part of the decarbonization initiative and so on uh, arbor day recently for example all everybody the the entire uh, what we call national conservation commission invited the country to come and collect free trees and everybody in our schools our kids our leaders we saw them inviting people to come collect the trees, two trees and plant them, take a video and share it with everyone. We also have the National Botanical Gardens and we've been inviting all of our international partners to come plant a tree so that we're able to build on carbon sinks and so on. And then finally, I raised earlier in my initial comments about the question of financing. Uh, we have actually, as you would know, been, act, been advocating very heavily on the global stage led by our prime minister for greater investment in things like the Green Climate Fund. And we are also now investing, obviously, as you know, in, and you may have heard, in a green bank. We don't, for example, have a national bank, but we are now in the process of developing a green bank, which is largely for the purpose of making sure that there is that investment in the uh, adaptation, mitigation, and of course, the decarbonization strategies that are so critical for small island developing states like Barbados. And I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think it was a, a very comprehensive uh, answer. Uh, Jose Luis, uh, do you mind repeating your second question? Uh, I know it was about capacity building, but uh, if you could repeat, it would be of great. Uh... Yes, the second question is uh, what kind of measures besides uh, handbooks capacity, or capacity building can be done to improve the adaptation to climate change? Oh, OK. So it was on adaptation. Sorry, I, I didn't capture uh, this point. Um, I mean, I think the minister's reply was uh, quite um, quite detailed. Uh, does any of the other uh, fellow panelists have anything to add specifically on capacity building when it comes to adaptation? I, I can just add, I, I, I think it's related enough, but um, we're having these events right now called King Tides and they're international, but I think they're called that, maybe they have a different name in a different country, but these large tidal events that we have here on the coastline and we um, work with visitors and communities to take pictures of these coastal areas during a normal period and then also when it's flooding and so it's an interesting way of thinking of capacity because we're actually using visitors to document these flooding which could be with a sea level rise the communities that will be most impacted um, and then using that documentation um, to advocate to local government for adaptation saying maybe these buildings shouldn't be here because four times a year um, they're getting completely flooded and so as a small nonprofit I, I we may not have the capacity to actually do building and construction um, but we do have like these marketing channels to encourage visitors and communities to take those really interesting storm photos safely uh, in order to use that as an advocacy piece, which then we could be a part of the advocacy for adaptation. So just one very specific example. Thank you, Arika. Thank you so much. Uh, ben, do we have additional uh, questions? I'm sure we do. Yeah, we've got lots of hands up, actually. So we, um, if we can try and get through as many as we possibly can. Um, Shannon Gihan, we, th we thought we maybe could um, come to you next um, uh, to give a, a private sector pers perspective um, from the industry. Morning, everyone. It's Shannon Gihan. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Travel Corporation. 
So massive congrats, firstly, and thank you for all of the truly wonderful presentations. There's some really interesting tactics that I think everyone can learn from. On that specifically, you know, I'm curious because what we're seeing in, in my opinion are several best in class individuals on our screen. Um, unfortunately, we don't always see that level of progress in all destinations. And we talk a lot about collaboration, something that I believe firmly in. We're a group of 40 travel brands. We're asset heavy. We're in our target setting progress process. And as you all can imagine, um, it's a challenge. And so I'm curious about the role of the, you know, the declaration, um, uh, the team behind the declaration as you know, being a catalyst for that, for that necessary collaboration. Because it's difficult to uh, point the pieces together with travel trade um, and destinations always, so. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I definitely, as uh, I think it was Jeremy mentioning the hard work starts now that the <laughs> declaration has uh, been launched. I mean, I, I think it's quite related to that role that you are highlighting of, um, you know, facilitating the collaboration, which, as we all know, doesn't happen automatically. But um, we're in a good momentum, so let's not let it pass by. Uh, do we have another? Um, yeah, actually, oh, um, Sally Davies just actually um, uh, posted up, I think, to say that she'd like to uh, follow up um, uh, on uh, Shannon's comment there. So um, perhaps we could invite um, Sally to speak next. Sally Davy, travelist. Hi, can everybody hear and see me okay? We can. Great, thank you. Um, I think just so important again to echo what everybody's saying. Thank you so much to all the speakers and all the panelists, and of course, the group behind this declaration. I'm sure um, you're quite used as, as I am to these events being uh, uninspiring quite often, and it could not be more different today. You have all given me personally so much hope, and we are so proud at, at Travelist um, to be a founding signatory of this critical commitment. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that really important piece about the whole system and, and sector alignment, and, and especially on the consumer side as well, because it has been touched on a little bit in the discussions, but I think merits real consideration. And of course, the declaration talks about the need to accelerate sustainable consumption. Um, just very briefly, I think some folks already know that Tra uh, Travelist is a, a non-profit working to bring sustainable travel and tourism information to the mainstream, first into the mainstream consumer experience and help consumers make better choices, which I know was, was mentioned as um, by Kat, I think, on the panel. Um, so we started by bringing together some of the world's largest consumer platforms and OTAs to collaborate on unifying their approach to sustainability reporting so that consumers get clearer and more consistent information. And I think that's going to be such a critical part of this, right? But, but Travelist is also in itself about aligning with the whole system and ensuring our strategy is aligned with the Travel Foundation or WTTC. I think each of us have that really important role to make sure that we're not duplicating, we're not, um, somebody mentioned, reinventing the wheel. Um, and as a sector, I think this is a really big issue we have, right? We, we tend to be quite siloed. And so I think this is a really important thing for all of us to consider with this idea of collaboration and alignment. How is it that we can go further with ensuring that we're aligning our strategies with those of the other organizations represented here? And I think that critically comes back to that unified guidance and, and toolkits piece that again has been talked about. Um, you know, I think Jeremy said right at the top, there are some pieces of, um, there are, there are toolkits and piece of guidance being published today. How can we all come back to signposting folks, especially those who are earlier in their journey, towards the same pieces of best practice, the same information and guidance? Because, you know, this is a big challenge we have at Travelers when we're trying to help consumers. There are so many labels, so many tools, so many different ways of measuring that are all just slightly different to each other, and it really blocks engagement and action. And I think that's where we're going to come unstuck if we're not careful. And I think it comes back to what Shannon was saying. It's not just each part of the sector, it's the entire sector aligning together. And so I just wonder as a final sort of thought whether this is also part of our commitment to the Glasgow Declaration, as well as our plans and our, our commitment, it's also aligning our plans and our approaches of how we're going to measure and deliver against those 2030 targets. Um, because I think ultimately that's how we're going to 
be successful here. So uh, just wanted to share that as thoughts and as some of the challenges that we have found and hopefully that contributes from, um, from the consumer's perspective also. Thank you. Virginia. Lisa, would you like oh, to sorry. react? Sorry. Oh, just no, no, sorry, because no I problem. see Lisa's hand is, uh, is up. Did you want to react uh, to what Sally was? Uh... Sure, I can. Um, I've I made some notes uh, as we started talking over the course of the conversation. And, and one of the things I scribbled to myself was about the importance of the approach to implementing the Glasgow declarations and the pathway, taking a multi-criteria type approach. And so uh, the incorporation of the consumer-based uh, agenda is very, very critical. And I think you, Virginia, when you asked earlier about cross an interagency collaboration across the governmental sector, that's critical. And we've had a lot of feedback from the private sector stakeholders. So we need to have multi-layer criteria approaches that allow us to assess the implementation of the commitments that we're undertaking so that there are going to be different approaches that are going to come from quite from consumers, for example, than those that are going to come from your international partners. There's going to be an entirely different role that's going to come from the development partners and that's going to come from financing and investing partners. Then there's a very different role to be played by the public sector versus the private sector. But all of these various elements and the stakeholders come together to form a part of the overall coalition that is implementing the outcomes that we have set for ourselves. And we have to be able to use criteria to measure them and to ensure that those criteria are matched by supporting measurable performance indicators that we are all able to then follow through on and where there's a shortfall that we're going to be implementing them and making sure that we see the results that we signed ourselves up to. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Joss, please go ahead. Yeah, maybe three brief comments on uh, Sally. Thanks for the uh, opportunity. Um, I think what we see happening in the Netherlands and, and maybe elsewhere too, is that before COVID, roughly speaking and generalizing uh, uh, heavily here, is that interest of, let's say, cities, regions, nations, and those of the market players, the industry, were perfectly aligned, focused on more people, more visitors, more spend, more employment, et cetera, et cetera. What COVID did, uh, and to a certain extent over tourism in some areas too, is that these interests seem to disconnect and increasingly being at odds with each other. So therefore, and that's why I'm so happy with a task force where government and industry together talk about the sustainable development of the of the of the um, destination is that we really need to bridge the gap between what market dynamics at the moment dictate uh, quick cash, liquidity, continuity, survival versus a more conscious and aware uh, and different kind of visitation in the future. Therefore, collaboration and dialogue is key. I think second one, NTOs, DMOs are at the perfect place between public and private sectors to be the enabler of that dialogue. And I think in practical terms, I think we're wonderfully positioned to take the customer journey as you addressed and see how and where and when and by whom we can nudge consumers into the desired uh, direction. And again, it's a chain of suppliers in different silos, but NTOs and DMOs, I think, are perfectly positioned between public and private sectors to do so. And I think one wonderful example uh, uh, in one of our coastal resorts is about integral approach. Integral as in there was a, a coastal resort with a lot of cars parked in a massive parking place. It was ugly, uh, but there an interesting thing happened. They didn't go for the quickest route to success, but the most difficult route to success by integrating three things, urban planning, coastal safety and climate adaptation, because we are not an island state, but we are, as you know, half of our country is below sea level. Um, and uh, the visitor economy, what they did is they built a new coastal safety um, protection uh, in that coastal resort in the, in the, in the uh, shape of a parking uh, garage. So the parking garage is about a mile long, but the parking garage acts as a new and high tech uh, coastal protection um, how you call it, device, uh, 
Uh, and at the same time, for the locals and the visitors, it means cars off the road, better facilities for electric uh, vehicles, uh, and moreover, the parking garage is completely uh, 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 hidden because they created the natural dune landscape on top of the parking garage. So they revitalized nature, they created a better and nicer place to live in and to visit, and at the same time it was all about coastal protection. So a wonderful example, which was a rocky road, they could have gone for the easy option, uh, but by taking this integral approach, they really were able to align three to four different interests into one wonderful initiative. And I think we need more of those. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Sally. You triggered quite a debate, which is fantastic. Do you have any remarks to add to what the colleagues were uh, mentioning after your intervention? No, thank you. That was fantastic. But Joss, I'm going to go and look that up right away. It's a fantastic example of the kind of joined up thinking we need to, to inspire across the board. So thank you. And thank, thank you. you. This is a question for all panelists. Um, do you have time to stay with us for maybe five, ten more minutes? No, you don't? You do? Yes? Because we have a pile of hands to deal with. <laughs> so, uh, not really. Okay, we understand. Um, and I think it's uh, fine if you have to disconnect in time. We understand. Uh, we'll take a couple more uh, questions and, and then wrap up. Is that okay for you, Ben? Yeah, okay. Um, I think we um, should go to uh, Megan at uh next, uh, Megan. Um, you've been mentioned quite a lot already um, in because of your comments in chat um, and you said that you would have a follow up from uh, uh, Sally's comment too. So uh, I think it'd be great to have you now. Okay, thank you very much for having me and it's been a wonderful session. It's so inspiring <clears throat> to hear everyone talking about these topics and having uh, the great opportunity to share our expertise. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to speak on behalf of uh, my new position at the Sustainable Tourism Asset Management Program, which is at the Center for Sustainable Global Enterprise at the Johnson College of Business at Cornell. Um, and we've been working um, both at Harvard and now at Cornell on developing tools, many of which are very re relevant to the conversation today. Um, I just want to say, I think we all know a stable climate is an essential asset which requires cooperation across all industry and government sectors. We at Stamp worked on the invisible burden of tourism with the Travel Foundation and demonstrated that travel and tourism sector really, you know, we have been slow to measure our climate emissions. And, and even more so, we've been pretty slow to use science-based sustainability benchmarking. And, and so we focused on that. We, we think it's so important that we do have common methodologies. And, and one of the comments I have is that while individual companies may measure, which is so important, and we certainly don't want to, you know, in any way imply that it's not, but what our research has shown that the only way to capture all of these supply changes is at the destination level, especially those that can't afford to do the measures, uh, such as the SMEs. Um, so that's why I, I just love Lisa Cummings' comments, because she's already looked at the full holistic question of how to get the full scope of emissions in Barbados. I really congratulate you on that, um, because what we really need to understand is the cumulative impacts of tourism at the local and regional level. So just quickly what I wanted to say, and again, looking forward to sharing with everyone in future about how we can work together uh, but STAMP is now moving ahead with a Global Sustainable Destination Management Academic Certificate, uh, which we will do with eCornell and other partners to be announced around the world. Uh, this 40-hour virtual certificate will be accessible for all professionals and students worldwide in 2022. We've got a real partner here now with eCornell, um, and we really wanted to announce the other partners, but the, it's going very well, and we should have the other partners announced soon. Uh, but one of the things I just wanted to tell you, because the skill base, the importance of changing our ability is through skill base. And so what we want to offer is tools to manage climate impacts at the destination level through our certificate program. Um, and also just to have us rely more on sustainability benchmarking standards um, so that we have a next generation of carbon accounting at the destination level. So thanks so much for the opportunity to say anything. <laughs> 
Thank you, Megan. Pleasure to have you. Uh, ben, I think we need to agree on two more uh, interventions and, and then we give the floor to Jeremy. Okay, and, and sorry that we, yeah, I mean, we would like to obviously give everyone an opportunity, but um, perhaps we can um, continue in the chat um, for those that <laughs> I'm not going to call up. Um, but uh, uh, Francois Grasper, um, I wonder if you would like to um, uh, make your comment now. Um, I think you were, were already um, commenting in the chat um, uh, about community, so perhaps that's where you're um, going to speak from. Uh, thank you, Ben. Thank you all for this uh, great, great event. So I am Françoise Gaspard and I represent the Ile-de-France Paris region. And I would like to share with you um, a comment from our side. Uh, we think in Ile-de-France that uh, what's the most important things today is uh, the involvement of citizens and in particular the young generation. It's the reason why we organized last year our own uh, regional COP. And uh, because in Ile de France, we have already uh, adopted, like you, uh, various strategies uh, which are charging air plan, cycling plan, energy climate strategy, etc., green plan. But now we think that we have to accelerate the green transition. And of course, all these um, concrete plans have positive, positive impact in the tourism sector. So now we have decided uh, to put 10 billion euro uh, use for the environment during 2020-2024. And as I said, uh, the citizen involvement is key. And it's a reason why now we have decided to give the opportunity for residents to, to become active player and uh, to take part to the decision. So now the region allows working or studying residents of the regions to get involved in a project. Uh, in five uh, different areas, including, for example, sustainable mobility and tourism, renewable energy. So I think it's a concrete example to show you that it's possible to change the thing. Uh, it's not just a question of money, it's also a question of change the mindset of the people. And uh, I, I think it's important and it's very important for me to, to share with you this concrete example today. Thank you. Thank you, Francoise. Ben, who's our, the last person that will intervene? Do we have one more question, or we? we yeah, we um, we'd like um, Paul Easto, please, um, from uh, Woodland Scotland. Um, and apologies to those who remain with their hands up. We're, we're sorry about that, but let's try and um, please, please do put your comment into chat, and um, we'll either try to um, talk about it um, through chat or uh, follow up with you afterwards. Hi everyone, thanks for squeezing me in. I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, just your mercy on the question of the panel. Uh, we're a tour operator in DMC here in Scotland. Um, today, to coincide with that declaration, we've actually launched a carbon uh, labelling scheme for our consumers, which will give a carbon score, carbon footprint for every product that we sell. So I'm just really interested to hear from the panel if they've done any work on this. This is all about making it easier for the consumer to make better choices. And when we did this work over the last six months, we were amazed at just how different the carbon impacts of travel can be. So for example, a Caribbean cruise is 20 times more carbon intensive than one of our holidays. And I'm just not sure consumers are aware of the decisions they're making. So I'd love to see a standardized uh, approach across the industry, which would allow customers to make the same choices as like they do with a bar of chocolate or a box of cereal where they can see the nutrition information, they can see the carbon information. Um, so just keen to hear if there's any work that you're aware of that's being done. Thanks, Paul. In the case of the cruise, the, the ingredients would be also the footprint from the accommodation function of the cruise and the footprint of the transport function of the cruise, because normally we tend to look at it combined when actually there are two functions that the cruise is, is providing. Uh, that's my little uh, uh, input here, but uh, maybe somebody else in the panel wants to uh, react to what Paul was just uh, yeah, I can I can give two examples, recent examples that came across, uh, not our own, but I know that Air France, I was uh, pointed out, if you plan a route through Air France, they nudge you into taking part of the, uh, the, the route, particularly, the, of course, those with transfers uh, by train, uh, and it's actively nudged in your travel schedule, which is, is I think, uh, a nice example. Uh, and uh, from what I understand, some of the OTAs are now uh, adding sustainability labels uh, uh, and nudges 
into their uh, selection criteria for people to uh, to search on their uh, platforms. So two examples that uh, clearly um, uh, are slightly different than maybe uh, three to five years ago. Fantastic. I mean, I think we could continue discussing for hours, but now we are really exceeding uh, the time. So I would really like to thank our panelists. You've been amazing. And thank you so much for staying also uh, a bit longer. Thank you uh, also very much to everyone uh, who intervened. Uh, uh, it's really, you know, exciting to see such a dynamic uh, group of people uh, willing to share. And it's exactly the spirit that we'd like to produce with with the Glasgow Declaration. So uh, really, really pleased. So um, I'd like to, to now uh, give the floor to our final speaker. Uh, you all know him, Jeremy Sampson, CEO of, of the Trial Foundation and uh, Chair of, of the Future of Tourism. Uh, coalition for, for the final uh, intervention of today. Jeremy, please. Thank you very much, Virginia, and thank you very much to our colleagues for an incredible discussion, a presentation today. I'm, I'm so honored to be a part of this and so honored as well to be asked by my colleagues to provide the closing remarks on this really momentous uh, occasion of, of uh, launching the Glasgow Declaration and celebrating um, all the work that we've uh, that we've um, accomplished so far. Um, so my section is called um, Catalyzing a Sector, but I think it's even more important that we begin by reflecting on how our, setter, our sector can be a catalyst. Today is an important moment for, for travel and tourism. We're coming together for the first time with one voice and, and a clear commitment to keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees and, and to be a real part of the solution. So for me, what's really exciting is for us to recognize the catalytic role that tourism can play, particularly if we work together at all levels and, and build on the unique characteristics that we have as a, as a sector and as an industry. So in terms of those unique uh, unique characteristics that we have, first of all, the fact that tourism is quite global and local in, in nature. This allows us to think about international collaborations such as this one, to think about multinational cross-border collaborations and ones that are led by um, local uh, and community organizations. This allows us to share learning and solutions at all levels. And it really provides us an opportunity wherever possible to engage with communities. This allows us also to, to think about how we can merge top-down approaches and, and bottom-down approaches at each level. Indeed, tourism also uh, provides a vulnerable and valued nature um, to our destinations. Tourism values destination assets like no other sector, I think, but these assets are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, particularly the coastlines, the heritage sites, and the fragile ecosystems that tourism depends on. I think tourism is ideally placed for supporting the destinations that it relies on and, and which are most at risk of climate-related degradation and loss in order to become much more resilient. And as was pointed out, one of the pathways of the Glasgow Declaration is regeneration. Tourism has clearly a positive role to play in protecting valuable ecosystems like mangroves, forests, fresh water and soil, and helping to revitalize our urban environments, particularly after the, the crazy last two years that we faced with the COVID-19 pandemic. Tourism is both public and private. We know that, and it creates a, a bridge between the two. Sometimes that bridge is, is not always well built, but the solutions will, be, uh, will bring everyone together, government, businesses, and community in a framework of destination stewardship, balancing the needs of, of different groups. And when we come together, there's the opportunity for true innovation and for collective action. And finally, tourism is both large and diffuse. Tourism is 11% of the world economy and a major proportion of many destination economies. 
It's also completely interconnected. And one of the things that we has been mentioned quite a bit today that we'll be particularly looking at going forward are supply chain emissions. Our alignment can send a clear message to our supply chain and can help tourism be a catalyst when it comes to impacting the other verticals that we touch. And finally, tourism plays a, an essential role in placemaking, part of reimagining our destinations as climate resilient, more equitable, and we know that tourism plays a, a, a real catalytic role in, in helping to achieve that. Through the Future of Tourism Coalition, we've been advocating for a new and more resilient model that puts communities front and center. This has been our attempt as a collective of nonprofit organizations to unite a, what has been a, quite a fragmented sector and to put some meat to the bones of that word that we've, this phrase that we've all used so much over the last few years, which is build back better. And that's through our 13 guiding principles that we that we developed collectively in which more than 650 organizations have signed on to over the last year and a half. I think to me, the future of tourism is a unique community because it's quite inclusive, um, it's multi-sectoral, it's global, and it's brought together organizations big and small around a single vision for the future of tourism, exploring new ways to collaborate at all levels. At the core of the future of tourism vision is this concept of destination stewardship, where public and private sector must come together with strong community representation to understand the full impact of tourism, to identify future risks and to manage and develop tourism so that it delivers on residents' priorities and the priorities of our climate in order to bring more opportunities and genuine value to our local economies. This same vision is found in different forms elsewhere. We have next doors, Barcelona Declaration focused on better places to live and better places to visit. The One Planet Network's vision for a responsible recovery from COVID-19. And we do believe that this is the moment for a reset, an opportunity to reframe what success looks like and rethink some of the words that we love to throw around, like value, by asking questions like value for whom and to what end. Next slide, please. <clears throat> This approach on destination stewardship also means looking to the future and managing impact and risk is where community issues and climate become one. I don't know how we can possibly go forward without ignoring the greatest global challenge of our time. Climate change presents a very real threat to the longevity and the well-being of tourism destinations, the communities who live there, and the sector that we all love. And it's already impacting so many communities, often the ones that are most vulnerable. So the urgency around climate, the climate crisis, means that visitor economies are already being compelled to adapt and will continue to need to do so, both to manage the impacts of a changing climate and to meet the international obligations and increasing expectations by visitors, investors, and governments to decarbonize and adapt. So how do we rally an entire sector to achieve such aims and to turn challenge into opportunity? I reflected a bit on the forum, and to me it's clear that there are a couple areas that we need to focus on in this initiative going forward. One of those is advocacy. There is a lot of work to do to bring others to the table to create the urgency, to accelerate, to scale the, the level of action that's required and to make sure that we have true community equity and involvement in this discussion. I think we need more access to knowledge, to solutions, to information, connections and inspiration. And I believe we need to be more aligned. There needs to be true collaboration, coordination and consistency if we are to achieve these ambitions. Just as tourism can be a catalyst for wider change, I, I see our role at the Travel Foundation and the role of the supporting organizations of the Glasgow De Declaration to be a catalyst for where we go from here. We need to create a ripple effect for change across our sector. We need to identify real, genuine, meaningful methods of collaboration and ensure that the right people are at the table. You may have seen that we just announced at the Travel Foundation that tourism declares um, and Travel Foundation have joined forces and that Tourism Declares will going forward be the flagship climate program of our nonprofit. We've been working closely together for quite some time, including collaboration on this declaration, and I'm really excited about where we go from here. And the Travel Foundation will continue to provide a unique role in supporting the Glasgow Declaration, working very closely with our partners at UNWTO 
to help our sector achieve these ambitions. By bringing all these partners together, I hope that we can be, uh, be in a leading position and a go-to organization for climate action and tourism. And to do, now, to do that now, we're working on mobilizing partnerships and resources for a new program, which I'll share more about with you in just a minute. But speaking of partnerships, I just want to call out the partners for this event for a moment, specifically Visit Scotland, Next Door, and the Future of Tourism Coalition, who we have been working very, very closely with over the past months. We're going to continue to work together on concrete initiatives going forward, so please watch this space. We need to, to demonstrate um, that, that meaningful collaboration that we've been talking about. And this group has also committed to having future events like this fantastic one that we've had here today. And I particularly love the style of open forum, dialogue, and discussions. I think we need more and more of that. So our sector can think and talk together about how we can overcome barriers and achieve the, the goals of the Glasgow Declaration. We'll share those with you soon. And we all stand by the idea that we really need to work hard at the momentum developed because most importantly, the discussions that we're having here in the framework of the COP26 need to extend far beyond the bright lights of Glasgow. So I mentioned to you a little bit about our program. I, I won't go into too much detail, but our program follows the, the same three pillars that I outlined for you just a moment ago, um, advocate, advocacy, access, and alignment. Under advocacy, our goal through the Glasgow Declaration will be to provide a global platform for accountability and inspiration. We'll, we'll amplify the voices which need to be heard and work closely with communities to ensure that they have the tools, resources, and capacities that are needed to scale climate action going forward. Under the access pillar, our focus will be ensuring that the most effective solutions are available and testing new ones where there are areas of need. We'll also be building out this Glasgow Declaration community to ensure that stakeholders, all of you on this call and the many more to come, will have the connections, the inspiration and the exchange opportunities to learn from each other, including on challenging issues like adaptation. We need to bring people together to solve these problems. And on alignment, most critically perhaps, I'm excited that our plans include demonstrating what collaborative climate action really looks like. So bringing together stakeholders in places and facilitating that shared responsibility for destination protection and value chain emissions that can only be achieved by working together. After all, again, we share suppliers, we share assets, and we share travelers. So we also need to share the solutions and the investments that will be required going forward. And there will be an advisory committee for the Glasgow Declaration that will ensure diversity, equity, and climate science remain at the heart of this initiative. Those of us leading the way, I think everyone on this call could be uh, categorized as such, have a co in common a desire to reset tourism, to really create a transition now, not just to address climate, the climate emergency, but to create tourism that is focused on bringing added value to communities that's more balanced, more inclusive, and more equitable, and with a much smaller footprint. This global movement is building, and I can see the momentum built increasing every single day. So I hope that we can provide the inspiration, the community, the collaboration, and yes, the accountability that are going to be needed to move our sector forward. This also means working together with you and your local context to decide how the five pathways of Glasgow can be a framework and an opportunity within your, uh, within your own community. I think the resources and the knowledge exist, and there's so much that's possible even within our existing mandates as a sector, as destinations, as companies, and the way you promote your products, engage with visitors, and educate your industry. We also need to remember in this moment to meet people where they're at to use tourism as a tool for building knowledge, changing hearts and minds so that stakeholders of all sorts can join us on this journey to come. And where there are gaps, let's be a global community focused on tourism and climate action, growing every day and supporting one another in this journey going forward. So we look forward together to working together to ensure that the Glasgow Declaration is truly the catalytic moment that we believe it can be. And of course, as my fellow panelists have said, now the hard work begins. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I have my ticket for the journey, so <laughs> really happy to to be together uh, on, on this one. Um, 
we really have come to the end of our session and uh, I really like to thank uh, Jeremy for the conclusions but everyone else who intervened also the super uh, motivated uh, participants and audience for your dynamism and uh, really I think as we have said in a number of occasions already uh, let's not not miss this momentum let's not let it pass by let's put it to to work for the sector for a transformation of tourism to a more sustainable and resilient and competitive uh, sector we we all have much uh, to do and it will not always be easy but as uh, lord thurso remarked if we have the will and the energy to do so it is possible and i think we do so opportunities uh, await for our industry and looking forward to working together on this. Thank you all. Have a nice afternoon.